start my talk the way I usually talk, uh, start. One day I came upon a graduation ceremony in a little village high up in Mount St. Patebido. We arrived there and we were drawn to this music in the town square. And we were shocked to see that all the musicians were like eight years old and they were all playing brass band. <laughs> in this town, pe kids learn how to play an uh, instrument before they learn to talk. We were invited to the celebration that followed, and one of the parents stood up and said, Hago este ofrecimiento, I make this offering, porque solo no se puede compartir la vida, because alone one cannot share life. Others must be there. And I can't tell you how happy I am that you are all here in this big debut day for me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was trying to challenge myself to do something new. And uh, I don't want to get you all down, but if you're, if you're all my friends here, you know one of the reasons that I'm doing this, which is because I have Parkinson's. So I'm trying to prove to everybody that you can do anything in the world if you have this condition, and that nothing will stop you. Absolutely. And when that's very I used to start my talks by saying, there's no discrimination. I'm a Mexican. I'm a woman. I'm short. I've been fat. And look at me now. And you probably don't agree with me. Some of you probably don't agree with me. But then again, you didn't have a grandfather that had three daughters and then 10 years later have a son. And he used to say, Prefiero tener una hija puta que una huevona. I'd rather have a daughter who's a whore than one that's lazy. <laughs> you, you also didn't have a, a mother who kept on saying, if, don't tell me you can't do it, you can do it. Amarrate un huevo, make some balls. Just get on there and do get back on the horse. You know, my mother was like this John Deere tractor that we used at the ranch to fix the water holes. There was no stopping her, and crying was not allowed. And she was as hard on herself as she was on us. She worked day and night at the ranch, you know, making cheese, making, you know, canning, making butter. She cooked for the big house, which is our house, and then the small house of the cowboys. She worked us to death. Well, my poor father there was trying to keep us being a lady, but, you know, which was kind of hard there with my mother. And, but at the same time, you know, he was very proud of me because I could go out and kill a rattlesnake with a 10-inch whip or, or break horses or, or perhaps, you know, neuter and brand and do all the things that you do in a ranch. Life was beautiful, I mean, at the ranch, until I went away to boarding school. When I was a little girl, I was about eight years old, I went to my mother and I said to her, why did you name me Serena? Why couldn't I have a normal name like Ana, Cristina, Imelda, anything? She said, because it's gonna look great in lights, honey. <laughs> now, we lived in a ranch that was like five hours away in bumpy dirt roads from anything near. There were no stores, there were nothing. What did she see in this insecure little girl who used to stammer and, and that, that made her decide that, that she, I was going to be a star? You know, I really would appreciate it if anybody has any comments just to, you know, sort of keep quiet right now because it's kind of distracting. And, you can, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them as we talk. But I really would appreciate your attention. I'm going to be like Vicky Carr. <laughs> anyway, so she, she dedicated her life. So this is a story about her as much as it is about me. My mother was just this amazing force of nature. And people would meet me and say, isn't Sarela wonderful? Yes, but you, have you met Aida yet? <laughs> you know, so it was, that was always the second thing. So at the, end of, at the end of her life, I said to her, have you had a happy life, Mom? And she said, no. I would have liked to have had the life you've had. And I said, you did. I took you everywhere. So let me just tell you a little bit of the story about this. I was married to a widower with three kids. I started making cookies for, for a living. And then all of a sudden, my sister was married to a very rich guy at the time, started hiring me to do parties for her. And then the friends started hiring me, and my mother said to me, I'm going to I'm going to give you your inheritance in life, and I'm going to take you to cooking lessons. And she took me to this, she, I don't know how she found this woman, but she found this woman in Beverly Hills who taught me about catering. 
I happened to teach me the most important lesson in my life that I tell everybody that they have to do, which is you have to develop an identity, a style <coughs> that everybody will relate to you. So if you're catering a party and somebody tastes something, they say, oh, Sarela must be catering now. And I am. So then we went off, you know, to this class with Lillian Hayes, private class for a whole week. She turned out to be the first certified woman executive chef. And one of the classes was Tex McCalmex. I said, forget it. I mean, what, is, what is this woman thinking? Anyway, it turned out to be my chilaquiles, which are one of the biggest things in the whole world, you know, because, because it was not a traditional thing. But before that, I'm sort of jumping ahead of time, okay, ahead of time. I'm going to be cooking too, but because of the situation here, it's a theater. So I'll, I, I, let me back up a little bit, okay? I was the dark one of the family. For Mexicans, that is the most th horrible thing in the world. My sister, you can be blonde and light and ugly, but you're prettier than the dark one. So what ended up happening was that my father and my mother decided they would work on my mind. And, and make me very special. So, you know, my father would, you know, would sit down and talk to me. He was a very sort of reserved man. We, we, he could not converse with us on a normal basis, so he would sit at the dining room table and he'd go, da 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 who composed that? Well, of course, you know, we didn't know that it was Carmen at that time, and he said, go get the encyclopedia. So we'd go get the encyclopedia and we read. We lived, we lived in a cattle ranch in that my grandfather had given to my mother when my brother, my first brother died. So it was this magical life. My father was this very tormented kind of man who loved to watch, you know, like Jack Benny, and he used to come in, he loved the road runner, and he used to drive my mother crazy by going beep, 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 you know, for everything, and walk into the room like that. But at the same time, he spent all his time teaching me and developing my brain. And he told me, the only sin in life, honey, is to waste your talents. And you have been given many of them. And it is your responsibility to use them and use them responsibly. So I've been trying to do that. Okay, so now here we are at the ranch. They said we're sent off to boarding school, which was the worst thing in my life for me because I wanted to be a horse. I wanted to stay at the ranch. I wanted, I, I, I loved that life. We went to boarding school and never came back. So, I mean, we went home for holidays and stuff. But when I got out of high school, my father, I, I, my father would not send me to college. He sent me to finishing school, which is not the finishing school like the one you have here, but it's to teach you how to be a housewife, you know, to disdain and shadow embroidery and make layette <coughs> sets with crocheting and make patterns and flower arrangements and cook the food of the fancy people from Guadalajara. Because we had sent me to Mexico because he didn't want me to, he didn't want me to uh, lose my culture, which is wonderful because I'm bicultural and bilingual completely. So we finally there I am for one year. I did a beautiful tablecloth and organza with beautiful silk flowers and all this, and I still like to do the crafts. And it was very useful when I had my line at Walmart. But uh, they said I'm not doing this, Dad. <laughs> So I went to, this, they happened to open a, a, a school of mass communications. They brought two people in from uh, Fordham University who spoke no Spanish. So all of a sudden I was in working all the time and going to school and I learned mass communication, which has served me very, very well in life. So that's where we are at this point. Then um, I go back to El Paso, got married, no, 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 no. And then I start doing this, uh, this particular catering. And the second class that we took, my mother, we were going to go to New Orleans. No, we were going to go to Atlanta. It was a part of years. And I said, Mom, I'm not going to go learn how to make peanut soup right now. I don't really need that. So we looked up, and we were recommended to go to New Orleans to a school that was called the Enraged Chicken. And it was those places that, that, uh, that, the, that the students make all the food. And the first thing we learned how to make was peanut butter soup, you know, like that. And we said, no, forget this. And my mom said, forget it. We're going to go eat at all the restaurants and duplicate the food because both she and I could do it. <coughs> On the second day, we went there. Cállate. On the second day, I met Paul Prudhomme. And Paul Prudhomme was to make my whole life different. 
But at this time, I was very, very shy. You're not going to believe it. And uh, we went to a family wedding, and everybody was getting up to, 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 to sing. And I said, I'm going to do it too. And my cousin said, you're not going to do it. And I said, yes, I am. My sister was sitting there like eating this whole basket of bread, like, like dying of nerves. And, and she said, you had this look of determination. So to get this going, I'm going to sing that song for you. Now, I've never sung in, private, in public like this. And I've done this class many, many times. So if I didn't put in a fear factor, it wouldn't be any fun. OK, so, so anyway, this is a very sad, sort of like a real matcha song, you know. So it's like, this is Humberto, who is this brilliant guitar. Yeah. Ya tengo otra en tu lugar Pa' que sufra Pa' que rabie Pero te puedo jurar que es mejor que tú ni hablar. Tú no me puedes negar, ya lo ves, ya te adoré y que me perdone Dios. de ti que eras mi gloria adorando te recé y tú me mandaste al demonio y yo más de mí le hablé y al final te perdoné porque nadie te enseñó a tener buen corazón porque tú no tienes padre porque tú no tienes madre Pobrecito, huerfanito. Did anybody get any of the words? <laughs> it was not the easiest song to pick, but anyway, it has to do with like, you know, I have somebody else in your place now. You can rage now. You can cry now. No, he doesn't look at all like you, but I can swear to you that he's much better. I, I, I cannot, de you cannot deny that I love you like a beast. Okay, like, uh, and, and, and I went up to God, and, I, and may God forgive me, because I went up to the sky, and I grabbed some of the stars, and I threw them at your feet. And, and I knelt before you and prayed for you because you were my glory. And you sent me to the devil. <laughs> But anyway, so then I went and spoke to God, and at the end I forgave you, because no one, no one ever taught you how to love, because you don't have a mother, and you don't have a father, you poor little orphan. <laughs> so I don't know why I picked that song, I guess I must have felt that way. Anyway, so I'm going to, actually, this is sort of like a cooking class with a very uh, kind of difficult situation here because it's an induction thing, and it only takes like stainless steel things. So I might get burned, but that's okay. 
It doesn't matter. We can't really cook anyway, so let me have a... Okay, I need a mother here. I need a mother. My mother always was part of my act. Because I don't have any recipes up here, so if I forget something, you have to tell me. Who's going to be my mother? I might need a volunteer. Can I be the mother? You can be, you can be the mother, Peter. Okay. Okay. okay, by now you probably have figured out that this is a ploy to have all my good friends meet. Do you have, do you have the recipe? Okay. So anyway, so my mother was quite a bit. You know, when I met Paul Perdome, she get, we were blessed up in next to him. She kept on saying, go talk to him, honey. Go talk to him. And I wouldn't go talk to him. And finally I said, okay, I'm going to go talk to him. And I changed. This is Peter Kimmelman, a very good friend of mine. He's going to be my mother today. So I'm going to be making picadas, which is a dish that I picked only because I can tell you a story about it. <laughs> I should say, in my real life, I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm not a cook. <laughs> He's an actor and many other things. I need the little plastic bag here for the tortillas, otherwise I just have to make it by hand. You might not have the right recipe right now, so check. Okay, we need the picadas. Yes. Okay, oh, but Peter is very organized. <laughs> okay, you know what, when I was, in, I was recently in Peru, and my friend said, what are you going to do about, uh, about wardrobe changes? And I said, wardrobe changes? <laughs> I mean, I didn't, wasn't even thinking about that. <laughs> so anyway, so I decided to make my jackets that will probably be my next big sort of business. So I made this jacket yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Rich was over there and said, my, my friend Rich said, who's going to do all that? I said, don't worry, I'll get done. <laughs> okay, so, we have, uh, so we're going to be making this tortilla. And the reason I picked this particular recipe is because I, I wonder how you turn this thing on. Help? <laughs> Mother, do it. Mother, do it. Okay. Anyway, we, we had many, many outposts at the ranch. And because it was a very large ranch. And we used to go, and all summer we had a lot of cousins and everybody who would get, who would get there. And they would stay there the whole summer. So we, I would lead them to the different places. Oh, it's burned it. It's burned. I already burned it. I haven't even started. <laughs> anyway, so one day we arrived at this particular outpost, and she was my. You, you're gonna see. You probably saw pictures of this beautiful lady. It's an old picture. I don't think this is gonna work, but in any case, it doesn't matter. In any case, uh, I'll make the sauce, and that'll work. Um, so we get to this ranch, this outpost. It says, you know, like when you get to a little ranch, the first thing they do is they get a, like an ammo work pot the water and they sprinkle it all over the ground then they get a twig broom and they sweep up all the dirt the dust then they get the, the chairs out and put them in arrange them in a very nice way with a cloth and they start kidding the, the chair until it's clean and then they present you the, uh, the, the chair and she said i know what i'm gonna make i'm gonna make some enchiladas for you you might be saying oh great big deal but she said but i'm gonna soak the chilies and i'm not gonna use the blender I'm going to remove the pulp with my hands so that my essence is in them and that was going to be my gift to you. And that's a very Mexican, very Mexican way of entertaining. I never serve anything in my house except cheese, wine, and bread that I haven't cooked myself. I always do everything by hand. So that's a very Mexican thing. And, I, and actually I have another thing that I, want, I don't know that I'm going to be able to do with this cooking segment. But let's, let's get mo moving, Peter. Tell me about the sauce. What do I need here? Oh, uh, eight, eight ounces of... Tomatillos. Fresh crumble. Oh. About two cups worth. Okay. Does everybody have the recipe? Okay. So, <laughs> okay, we're going to start with the sauce. I think, I think it'll be okay, Peter. I think, okay, so tomatillos are, are usually called green tomatoes. They're not tomatoes at all. They're actually related to the kiwi and to the ground cherry. So we're just going to make the sauce, and we're going to have, and we're going to pretend we have some salt here. <laughs> and we have a garlic clove, and then we have salt in there. See, that's the part my mother used to say, you forgot the salt. 
Okay. Where's the other top, uh, Allie? Allie. <coughs> she probably didn't bring the other card either, so. Allie? Do you have one cup of Mexican crema? I have that. But, but, we, we, but we don't really have anything else. So I don't, Allie, where's the top of this? How do you mean you didn't bring it? I can't use this. I'll go get a blender, honey, please. Okay, she didn't bring it, so let's let's, let's forget about this, Peter, for now. Okay. Moving right along. Moving right along. Is that, anybody... is that respectful in speaking to your mother? <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you more stories about my mother. Because she was a very colorful person. She used to, when, when I came to New York, I had, was having really, really bad time financially, so I said to her, Mom, things are so bad that I think I'm going to go turn a few tricks at the hotel. And my mother said, that's fine, honey. Just don't go to the Sherry Netherlands, okay? Because that's where Bruno stays. And, you know, she meant it. I mean, she, my mother was very kind of raunchy and everything, but she, we came from a raunchy family, and I'm about to shock you to death. My grandmother and my grandfather had separate houses from the kids because they had a great romance. And they lived next door to each other. And she would say to us, don't buy any perfume, honey. Just stick your finger between your legs and go like this. That's the only perfume a man ever needs. Now, this is a woman who was born in 1898. Okay? And, and, and she, had, she, she had this house, and my grandfather was at the ranch working his ass off all the time. And he would come to the house, and she would go lock herself up in her bedroom to get ready for him. And then he would, he would start knocking, Ana llegue, Ana llegue. And she would not open the door. And finally she would say, Anna, I'm kneeling. And then she would open the door. And there she was for him. They had a beautiful romance. Okay, here we go. One, one, uh, one uh, what do you call it? Yeah, one thing, salt. <laughs> one pick up. But anyway, this is, this is really not about cooking letters. I want you all to participate, okay? So if you have any questions and everything, it makes things a lot easier. Peter, I don't think I'm gonna need your services. But thank you. She couldn't wait to get rid of me. My Mother's Day is coming. I know. Please ask me questions, please, uh, because you know, Okay, so anyway, so we had gone to New Orleans, and we had eaten like five times that day, and we passed by his restaurant. And uh, my mom said, that's the restaurant they, they, they suggested to us. And I said, Mom, we already ate five times. We were coming from, from, you know, from the little square where you eat the donuts, whatever they call beignets. And, yeah, from Le Mans. And anyway, so we went in there, and they sat us next to him. And my, he kept on looking at us. And my mother kept on saying, go talk to him, honey. Go talk to him. I said, Mom, I'm not going to go talk to him. Come on, please. I said, OK, finally. I said, OK, please. So anyway, so the guy really likes me. And, and I tell him what had happened about the course and all this. And he says to me, don't worry. You come into my kitchen and cook Cajun, and I will cook. Uh, and you, you teach me Mexican. So that week, he featured Mexican food the whole week. And I didn't know anything, by the way. My mother did all the food. So anyway, so, so it was, we became friends. And about a month later, he called me and says to me, you know that I have been invited to do this event that's happened on the green. And he was going to, he was, that was at that moment when he was the hottest. And my mother said, you should have asked him to go with him as, as, as a dishwasher. I said, mom, I'm not going to do that. So finally, a, a week later, he calls me and he says, what are you doing April 21st? This is 1981. And it's as clear as a bell in my, in my head. I said, he said, it, the party grew too big. Warner invited too many people. So, you know, they need somebody to go do the Mexican food. <coughs> so I brought my mother, and we did this big event at Tavern on the Green. And it was Paul Prudhomme, Alice Waters with her little lettuces. <laughs> and uh, Leo Steiner from the Carnegie Delicatessen and me. Now keep in mind that this was the first regional American buffet. And uh, so anyway, so we did this amazing meal. And uh, my mother cooked everything. And then, but then when it came time to present us, my mother said, you go out, honey. 
So I went down and everybody stood up, but I didn't know what it was about, so I sat down. And then Arthur Schwartz, who was supposed to be here, but heard his story, said to me, stand up, that's for you. So that was this amazing way to start, you know, your career. So anyway, so we, so we got a lot of press, but nothing happened. So for about a year, for about six or seven months, I would pick up the phone and put it down. Pick up the phone and put it down. Finally, one day, I got the courage and I called Warner the World. The owner of Tavern on the Green and his father, you know, was murdered or anything. And I said, do you remember me? And he said, yes. He said, I have a deal to offer you, at which he chuckled. And I said, why don't you have a party and I'll come up and cook for you? And he said, you got a deal. So my mother and I came and cooked for him. Craig Claiborne was there, and he loved the food. Of course, everybody was suspecting nachos and everything, but we prepared all regional Mexican food. So there we were, like at the end, making nachos and burritos. But in, in, any, case, in any case, I met Craig, and Craig said to me, the next time you come to New York, let me know, and you can cook for me, and I'll write an article about you. I said, I'm coming in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, this was all on my mother's dollar, except this time it was on my dollar. Because my, my mom had been taking me to classes all over the place. So I came, and Craig did this amazing article on me, this is memorable dishes from a me master Mexican chef, which did not sit well with Diana Kennedy. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, in any case, that was the launch of my career. And then he had me cook for Queen Elizabeth at the Reagan Ranch. And then he had me cook at the Williamsburg Summit. And I said, I'm moving to New York. So I moved to New York with $10,000, put $9,000 in an apartment. I was supposed to do a business with a food firm that didn't work out, in which I got a lot of shit for, but the truth of the matter is, now that I can reveal the truth, is that I didn't know how to do what they wanted me to do. So I, I had no experience at all. So anyway, so I was left with no money, and, but a nice apartment. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so my ex-husband said to me, you're going to have to come back. And I said, honey, I'll sell burritos in Central Park, but I'm not coming back. <laughs> so I happened to meet, uh, I happened to meet uh, Beth DeWoody. <coughs> I don't know what these chilies are doing here. These are not hot, but it doesn't really matter because they're not going to eat this. Anyway, so, um, anyway, so I met Beth the Woody, Beth Rudin the Woody, who took me under her wing and became my patron. They didn't give me money, but they had a party every single month until I could support myself. So that's one part of the story. And then... Um, and then the rest is history, I guess. I was supposed to do a restaurant with somebody else, and I didn't like the guy. So I was courted by David Kay, and uh, I have to tell this story, which I have never told in public, but the only one that knows him anyway is here, and she won't mind. Anyway, she, um, David was notoriously known for not wanting to do contracts. And I said, listen, this is my one chance in New York, and I'm not going to do a contract. Now, I had no food in the place at all. Went to Auntie Yard, which was the most gorgeous place ever. He put $20,000 on the table. And he said, if you take this right now, we don't, we don't sign a contract. And you have your restaurant, and I'll pay you another 20000 when we open. And I said, put your money away, David. I'm not going to take a chance. And thank God I didn't take a chance. Because as soon as the restaurant was like, really successful, he said, we don't need you anymore. And, and, I, and, I, and I left, and I said, are you going to let that place die? And I said, yep. <laughs> and, and so anyway, so I went away, and then he brought me back, and we built it back up. And then I went and opened my own place with no money at all. But I'll tell you that later. <laughs> let me just finish this, this thing. Let's see if this works. Is this connected? OK. OK, so now we have garlic, tomatillos. White onion, only white onion is used in Mexican food, okay? The yellow onions are not used. And then we have, we're gonna, this one has a top, thank God. <laughs> and it might even work. Not really. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm used to all this stuff, so. Water. So we're going to put a water here. Either way, you're going to taste the way it's supposed to be. It's going to be great. Okay. 
Now, plenty of cilantro. You know, people like cilantro or they hate it. Love it, love it. <laughs> Those that hate, it, that hate it can walk out. <laughs> we, we, used to have this, um, we used to have this customer who used to say to me, oh, no, I can't tell you that now because that's part of the story for next time. <laughs> okay, so I was supposed to have some, uh, you know what I'm going to do? This I can do uh, because this is part of this chapter. You have the onions, and uh, water? Uh, water, salt, garlic, we pretend salt, and then we says we don't have anything else, we're going to do this nice thing here. I've cooked like this before, by the way. Not out of preference, but out of necessity. Here we go. Anyway, you're going to have a taste of it. It's going to be perfect right now. Okay, oh no, we'll have to sing one more song. <laughs> At the ranch, you know, there was not much to do. Let me just finish this, because then you're going to get some, a taste. And there you go. This is a tomatillo avocado salsa. I have a new section on my website, which by the way has gotten, it uh, gets a lot of hits, over 6,300,000 hits last year and a million and point five page views, so somebody out there is listening. And uh, anyway, so, um, so I have a new section on my website called Naturally Light Mexican Food. And, um, and so this is one of the recipes from there, and there are many other ones. So I, I know that people prefer the fatty, cheesy, stuff like that, but I'm doing my best to change the mind of people. And I'm gonna use this little thing too. It's very hot back here. Okay, so. They, they, they want to see you. Okay, can you see him now? He's beautiful. Swing the couch, swing the couch around. Where, where's the bottle? Where's the bottle? Okay. We used to, at the ranch, there was not much to do. So every night we used to sing. Every night we used to sing, and we had a ball. And this is a song that my, we used to sing with my parents, and it was originally done by Pedro Vargas. And it's, it's, a, it's, called, uh, it's called Aquel Amor. And then in the meantime, you're going to get a tasting. Okay. Yeah. 
we're, we're going to get a, a tasting now. Any questions so far? Because we haven't done anything, really. <laughs> but any questions? Okay, so I'll tell you a joke. That was my grandmother's joke. She was kind of wild. Well, they bring the tasting. Okay, so my, the grand, so my grandmother was telling us the story about that. She was left with all the grandchildren. And, the, and, the, and you know, she, she said, tell us a story. They tell her, tell, tell us a story. She said, well, once there was this, this poor girl who had this two horrible stepsisters. I know. We don't want to hear that. <laughs> he says, okay, well, how about the one about the beautiful Sleeping Beauty? I know. That's a more boring. Well, there was somebody else that had, like, seven doors. Wasn't that like that? She said, no, I don't want to hear that either. Well, what the hell do you want to listen to? Tell us about the time you were a whore in Chicago. <laughs> so anyway, so talking about doors. You know, our, our little people. You know, there was this wonderful character who really changed the food world. His name was Joe Bomb. And Joe Bomb created Windows of the World. He created, I and mean, he was a genius. The Windows of the World, the Fonda del Sol, um, Mama Leone's, The Four Seasons. He was just this brilliant man. And when he was doing Fonda del Sol, they had this big, big ro rotisserie sticks there. And, and then they would bring him up at night to clean him. And, and when they were designing it, they said, Joe, there's not enough space here for anybody to stand here and clean this thing. He says, so we'll hire little people. God knows they know they need the job. <laughs> and he, he was like a really quotable guy. He was sh short and not that handsome, but boy, he was hot. You know, <laughs> he, he used to come to parties at my house and he used to say, you give good party. <laughs> so that's, you know how I got to know everybody in New York? Is that when I, the minute I started making any money at all, thank God the New York Magazine did an article on me it's just as I moved here on the best caterers of New York. I had just gotten here. Anyway, so I was doing a lot of parties. So any little bit of money that I got, I would entertain. And people would say to me, How, what should I bring you? bring you? Bring me somebody who can help me with my career. <laughs> and within a year, I knew practically anybody that mattered in New York, you know, because, because I mean, it really was. That was one of my tricks, but the other real trick, it wasn't a trick, it was just how I was trained, is that I sent everybody I met a thank you note, written. Thank you for, make, for <coughs> speaking to me last night, it made me feel so important. And na 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 na. And believe me, people remi remembered me, and, and I was able to not only meet everybody, but at the same time make very lasting friendships since then. So it's been a beautiful thing. So remember, thank you notes are the most important thing. So anyway, so um, we're waiting for the tasting. Any questions in between? No? That was about the ranch. The ranch? Yeah. Okay, well, the ranch, oh my god. The ranch was, I mean, you, you probably saw some pictures there. The, the ranch was a dream for me. I would not be the person I am without those beautiful years that I lived in the ranch. Um, I mean, we would get up very early in the morning, and I, before the, the remuda came down, the horses came down, I would be sitting at the, at the, on the fence right there waiting with my bridle in hand. And all of a sudden, you'd see the horses coming down, and the cows were like at the corral waiting to be milked. And then and the cowboy's wife was sitting there with a big enamel pot <laughs> worth of coffee. And we'd, they'd put inside of the corral, as soon as they started milking, we would bring our cup up, and we'd start like, putting the milk right into our cup. They'd bring this horse, and, uh, this, I was very spoiled. I was the oldest woman, not by my parents, but by all the employees. So one year I came to the ranch, and they had the, one of the, the, the husband of my nanny said to me, I have a beautiful horse for you. Well, I hated the horse, because he went like this the whole time, you know. So we were out riding the horse, and I see this horse fly by with his mane, and I said, whose horse is that? He said, it's mine. I said, I want it. And his name was Desprecio, which means something that nobody wants. And I, so I said, oh, he said, you can't have that horse. He throws everybody. He said, I want that horse. So, oh, which reminds me of this story of, of Warner. It just remind me to tell you this. Anyway, so, um, so anyway, so they brought the horse to the, to the house. They saddled it. The entire family came out. I went out. I said, Desprecio. I touched him. I got on the saddle, and I galloped off. 
from that moment, he was mine. I love that horse more than anybody or anything. I mean, he was just great. So in the morning, I would go get on the, on the horse bareback, just jump on the horse and take off, sometimes without a bridle, and just ride for an hour or two, and then I'd come back home and have breakfast. But anyway, it was just a beautiful life. At lunch, we always had Mexican food. At, din at dinner, we always had continental food. It was extremely, you know, very traumatic when my mother decided to have rabbit Provencal. But I have, oh, I have some news to share to you. Today I got news that my archive has been bought by Radcliffe, the Schlesinger Library. So, so all, of, all of the stories are in there now because they, they bought it. So I'm very thrilled because not only are they dedicated to women's studies, but they have the Schlesinger Library. And I'm going to be there with Julia Child. But anyway, it was, it was a perfect day that, to get the news. But anyway, where was I? Anyway, so at night, so I had if, even the cookbooks that I had from when I was 13 years old of my mother, you know, Chinese chicken almond, you know, lamb curry. My mother loved to have like like uh, theme parties, and theme dinners. So when she did, she used to cook for this woman named Helen Corbett, who was a chef at at uh, Neiman Marcus, yeah. And she used to make this curry, which was really a bechamel sauce with curry powder in it. But she made her own chutney and this wonderful lamb. And then it, and that she would give us a little cup of coffee with a cardamom seed in it. We always ate at the ranch with linen tablecloths, Wedgwood uh, china, and plastic flowers because there were no plastic, no, and candles. So we, we always had, my father really believed in having like an elegant lifestyle, you know, even at this ranch. And we, she had this pantry that you would, it was all arranged according to, to the, the nationality. She had escargot shells. She had like, you know, like bamboo shoes. She had pasta and then these big tin cans. It was a very privileged way of eating. I mean, frankly, we were all fat. And, but, but there were, but, which was a big problem because my mother drove us crazy. But the, but the thing is that it was just this beautiful way of, of, of growing up. And, you know, whenever we were kid a pig, all the, Cowboys wives would come in and we'd make chorizo. It was a real communal kind of way of eating. There was really nothing else to do, frankly. But at the same time, it was where I got my love of food. So I, I was at the ranch, I guess, till I was eight. And then, uh, then shipped off to boarding school. <coughs> that was the end of my life. Any other questions? <laughs> it, was, it was not the end of my life, but it certainly was the end of my happy life. Let's put it that way. Okay, I was, I was going to do something, but since I can't do, do it here, maybe I can. Um, I don't know where, where the tastings are, but I guess they're coming. This is lard. One of my favorite subjects. I have a video called Praise the Lard. Uh, did you know that home rendered lard is two thirds unsaturated? Did you know? Oh, oh, you've been paying attention. That's great. And it also has oleic acid, which helps break down cholesterol. So we cooked it with lard in my house, and I cooked with lard, not at the restaurant, but co of course. Just a few little things. I like tamales, because you can't make tamales with anything else. And uh, anyway, so Lupe, the wife of the, of, the, of the mayordomo, was one of my greatest influences. And you'll see many pictures of her because I really, really was mad about her. And she was teaching me how to make a roux. So she used to lard, and then she got the flour, and then she said, um, just cook it until it's the color of a cockroach. <laughs> and I always get it right. <laughs> so anyway, so what you're eating now is a picada. That's what I was gonna make here, but I didn't make it. <laughs> how, is it good? Oh, only to, oh, it's slow, I'm going to have to be talking like a lot, but it's good. Okay, well, since I, since I we mentioned the flower, I'll tell you another joke. There was this um, English class in French Canada. It says, students, today we will study the word probably. Now, Pierre, do you have a sentence with the word probably? He said, oui, madame. Yesterday I saw papa, and he has a rod, and he has the bait, and I saw to myself, probably papa is going to, bake a cake, uh, is going to go fishing. He says, very good, Pierre. Now, Marie, you have a sentence with the word probably? He said, oui, madame. Today I saw mama, and she has the flour, and she has the butter, and she has the sugar, 
And I thought to myself, probably Mama is going to bake a cake. Very good, Marie, very good. Now, Etienne, do you have a sentence with the word probably? Oui, madame. Yesterday, I saw my sister and her piano teacher. And she had her pants down, and he had his pants down. And I thought to myself, probably they are going to shit on the piano. <laughs> okay. There's supposed to be a break right here, but I guess, I guess I'll continue talking. Uh, Ali, any, other, any other questions, suggestions, before I like, undress? <laughs> Any, any other questions? Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting story. I, w I went to work with David Kay, and frankly, I would not, if it had not been for Eddie Schoenfeld, I would have not learned how to do the front of the house or the back of the house. When I started, going to, when I started working at David Kay's at Cafe Marimba, I didn't even know there was a pantry station. I just came in here and, and just blind luck, believe me. It was a Cinderella story. So anyway, so I worked at Cafe Marimba for, for two or three years. I cried every single day that I worked there because I was not in charge of the kitchen, but I got all the blame. There was this Esty there by the name of John Turzak, and I used to go complain. He used to say, I uh, give you the right to, to express how you feel, but unfortunately things are not going to change. I'm in charge of the kitchen. So when we got a one star, I cried all night long, and my mother was there. She hated crying, my mother. And she said to me, are you going to continue doing this to yourself? Be good to yourself. Just forget about it. So I wrote this four-page letter to, to Brian Miller, and I told him that I felt that the people who had the power had the most responsibility to know something about the food, which is what my, still my big pet peeve is with all the critics who don't know about food and go around destroying, you know, restaurants without knowing that guacamole table side is not the way to do it. I mean, it has to sit for a while, but it became a shtick, you know, so anyway, I'm not going to criticize. That's why I'm out of the restaurant business, and that's okay. But in any case, I wrote this long letter, so then he had this, this event where he invited a lot, a lot of us to go and, um, and critique his food. So it was, uh, Gail, what was the name of the guy from La Bernadette originally? Gilbert? Yeah, Gilbert Lacoste was there, and, and some other people were there. And then so Gilbert says to me, okay, so let's see if I have this right. You write books, you have two children that you send to school, you run a restaurant, you run, no, 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 no. She said, when did you ever get laid? And I said, oh, don't worry about it. I managed. <laughs> anyway, but in any case, we went and critiqued um, Brian, and it was kind of like a really fun thing. He was a really great guy. I mean, I have, oh, I, I was going to tell you the story about Warner. War, I love rock and tours, okay? That's, I mean, you want to make me happy, just tell me a story. And anyway, so Warner used to tell the story about this woman who became a very famous, you may be, maybe, maybe, yeah, you know who it is, but she used to go on a road star, in her roadster back and forth in Hungary with her fox tails flying and everything. And one day they stop her and they, and they check her, and inside of her is this big rock shining. And they, they said, aha, we caught her. So anyway, so they bring the jewelry appraiser, they clean it off, they put it in a cushion, and they said, but madame, this is not a diamond. She said, I know, but why do you have it there? I like it there. So that was, you know, one of the Did you miss the punchline? <laughs> That's supposed to be funny. So anyway, so. Anyway, are we finished eating here? Okay, let me, let's move on to the next one. Please, anyway, any, any interjections are welcome. Since I can't really cook, that was supposed to take like around 15 minutes of my, of my conversation here. Okay, we use Mexican crema, which is like typical to like, like creme fraiche. So if you've gotten it, you have that. We use queso cotija, which is an aged cheese. And um, let me tell you about Ira and her mezcales. Ira was my first mentee. She came here about five years ago. Ira, are you still here? No, she's not. She came here with not, not speaking one word of English. She formed a, a very, very interesting company, which was a, um, what is that? 
Oh, another thing, the same thing? Okay. <laughs> no. Okay, let's take all of this off. Uh, this is supposed to be a time for you to chat among each other, but what I, what I do, what I do yeah, my yeah, change. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. House lights, we need some house lights. Yeah. Okay, put that house yeah, lights up. Lights. We're going to have a 10 minute break. No me amenaces. No me amenaces. That's not a program song, but that makes everybody quiet, right? Real fast. Um, okay, all of a sudden I forgot what I was going to tell you. Okay, when, when, when we came to New York that first time, okay, they went to pick us up. Drew was Drew Nippon was at that time was the head of banquets at Tavern on the Green. They picked us up in a limousine by Tony Sassula, who was his partner. Hello, everybody. Okay. Anyway, so um, so they brought us to the hotel. We had a suite. It was amazing. We went to tavern. We ate every night, thinking of, of, of lunch every day at the Crystal Room. My mother was in heaven. So my mother says to me, you know, you have to go to bed with Paul Proudhon. <laughs> he said, you owe it to him. He, 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 he made you this big opportunity, and you have to do it. Mama, I said, I'm not going to do it. You know, he he's, he's weighs 115 pounds, and, and, and besides all that, she said, you have to do it. So anyway, so everybody says, well, did you? That's not the point of the story. <laughs> The point of the story is that my mother told me that I had to do it. And, and, and anyway, that was, that was my mother. My mother was just this amazing woman. So she, um, so with that, that's a little shocker. I'll tell you another story. And, and, anyway, so, so we, I, when Paul invited me, I said, Paul, I can't do that. I don't even know how to chop an onion like a chef. He said, you don't have to. You're the chef. Just say, bring me a chopped onion. And I've gotten used to cooking that way. But since, we, so, but since we don't really have any cooking thing, I'm actually going to try to cook something here, chop an onion, which I've never really mastered. But with this fabulous knife that we got at the, at the, at the City Meals on Wheels benefit, and whose founder is here, Gail Green, who's going to be crowned for, for doing this amazing thing. And anyway, they always give the best gifts when you participate there. So he gave me this fantastic knife. And uh, it's a Japanese knife. And if somebody can read the label, I can, I can help promote it, because that's the whole point of it. Anyway, if you're going to get one knife, get this knife. OK, so since we don't care that we're going to waste a lot of onion, so we're gonna, now we're going to do the shrimp salad that we used to have at the restaurant, another light recipe. And you're going to be pretty amazed at how I've gotten better at chopping this. When you have Parkinson's, it's not a really good idea to chop fast. I, I used to have this customer in El Paso who was the, pres the wife of the president of the, of, the, of the university. And she had emphysema, she had an iron lung. And she used to say, she loved to cook, she used to say, I always avoid recipes that say now working rapidly. <laughs> so anyway, so I've gotten pretty good at this. So here we are, chopped onion, one chopped onion. Like I told you. In Mexico, we only use white onions and preferably bulb onions, which are like made right before. And then we have some raw shrimp here, which we're, we're waiting for the for the cooked ones. Okay, so bring me. Okay, so bring bring this up. So anyway, so what we do is that we peel the shrimp, cut it in half, because that that makes it go very much far, farther. So, and when I cook the shrimp, I cook it in shrimp stock. I don't cook it in, um, in water. I don't cook anything in water. One of the secrets to the restaurant, why there was so, so many layers of flavor, is that we cooked everything in stock. If it was chicken, we cooked it in chicken stock. If it was seafood, we cooked it in, in seafood stock. And that added a whole layer of flavor. So this is one of my absolutely favorite recipes. And the only recipe I have that doesn't have garlic. So when, when we were invited to cook at the, at the gourmet, um, you know, there with the Sid, uh, what is it, Sid, uh, Newhouse? What is his name? Sai Newhouse had a rule, no garlic in the place at Gourmet, can you imagine? So anyway, so we went and cooked, and I made this recipe for him, and it was a big hit. And it was a hit at the restaurant. You can use anything. So here we have an avocado. Um, 
And I'm actually going to cut this one too. So it's going to be like this. This is another recipe for Veracruz and another recipe that's nice and, um, and light. Any questions? Can I join in the conversation? Um, I was very lucky to, to meet um, Bud Schoberg, who I know a lot of people don't respect, but I love him with all my heart. But I met him through this guy named John Bryson. Okay, shh. I'm talking. Anybody who wants to go talk, go talk outside. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Anyway, so John Bryson told me he was a great storyteller. He was, a, you know, one of the good old boys. He was in, in, you know, this guy had this big teeth. But he did this book on Catherine Hepburn, The Private Lives of Catherine Hepburn. And he also did this book with Armand Hammer. And he did all this amazing, amazing, um, would you bring me some of the salad, please? Okay, four, okay. In any case, he told me the story about Indio Fernandez. I don't know if you know who Indio Fernandez is. But Indio Fernandez was the first Mexican to win a Cannes Film Festival. And so anyway, he was, he was married to Luis Nevelson and Paulette Goddard and Dolores del Rio. So he said, tell me the story. He says, um, you know, there are a lot of things that people don't know about Dolores. One of them is that she's a fantastic cook. And secondly, is that she is always horny. You know, sometimes I come home, sometimes I come home and she'll be at the butcher block and I'll go kiss her neck and she'll grab me right there. And, and, and I said, Dolores, and she said, right here. So I'll give it to her right there at the butcher block. He said, one day we're invited by the president of Mexico to be a this. We look like a god and goddess. She's in organza and petticoats. I'm in my white tails. We, we get, we're sitting down, four boxes down from the president. The Tiffany curtain opens. Carlos Chavez is conducting. All of a sudden, I feel Dolores' hand on my crotch. And I said, Dolores, not here. She said, right here. So I lifted up all those petticoats, and I gave it to her right there. He said, you know, every time I hear the Eighth Symphony, I think of that. Okay, so. One avocado coming. Okay. Any other stories anybody has? Oh, no, there, there are many. Okay, the Taco Bell Chihuahua, a pit bull, and the Doberman pitcher are standing at a doggy bar having a drink when a really good looking collie walks in. She says, The one of you that can use the words liver and cheese in a sentence, the best can have me. So the pit bull says, I hate liver and cheese. She said, that is so boring. The, the Doberman pitcher says, I love liver and cheese. She said, that's even worse. The Taco Bell Chihuahua says, liver, cheese mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one avocado kind of mangled here. Okay, so we're gonna cut it. Anyway, we're not, we're not here to learn cooking techniques. We're here to learn about Mexican culture. You know, those people that I told you about that we went into the graduation ceremony are the Mije Indians. They were never conquered because the road is so hard to get up there. So the first time, the first time that, um, that I went to Oaxaca, there was this Mije couple at the square. And they kept on talking back and forth between Mije and, English, and Spanish. So I said to them, what do you teach your children first? Meaning the language. And they said, to say hello and to respect their elders. And I, and I, I sit here and I, and I look at so many people that don't understand our culture. And I, and I have to expound a little bit on this because this is part of my mission is to make our culture known and understood. You know, for a Mexican, education is not just about book learning. Education is about having manners having dignity, and having respect for yourself and others. And this applies to a laborer, or this applies to hope of, well, I don't know about now the hard sort of noble people, but anyway, anybody who has upbringing applies to us. Manners are very important to us as, as, as is dignity. And one time we had this uh, convention at the, at the Culinary Institute on, um, on Mexican regional foods, and they brought this Mayan cook who's about that big, from, uh, from, and made the first lunch. And he, uh, 
And they brought him up to the stage afterwards, and he started crying when they introduced him. And he could not stop crying. He could not stop crying. And finally, he said, uh, he, he finally stopped. We were all very uncomfortable by then. And he said, uh, he said to us, um, I thank the, Mexi the Cultural Institute, and I mean the Culinary Institute of America. I hear all this crunching. Did they give you the second thing already? Yeah. Um, Anyway, so, um, so I won't even continue. But anyway, so he said, I thank the Culinary Institute of America for allowing me to put the name of my community so high. And you know, and this is, you know, I, 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 I talk to a lot of people on, on the street and, uh, and they, they all say, you know, I don't want to be here. I'm nobody here. I want to go back where I'm somebody. So, I don't know, just a little food for thought. Anyway, so. The way that we put this together is we're going to make it, well, since you're already eating it, but I'm, I'm still going to do it. It's OK. You need extra olive oil. It would have been nice if I had a lemon crusher here. I guess I don't really need to teach you this, but I will. This is so good. Is it good? Yeah. And it's so easy, see? All you have to do is just mango an avocado, slice an onion, squeeze a lime, and, uh, and you've got this fabulous dressing. Any questions? Tell a story? OK, let's see what stories. I remember that, oh no, but that's too hard to, to translate. <laughs> How many Spanish-speaking people are there here? How about a half hand? <laughs> How about half? OK, well, two? OK, then I can't tell you the story. I'll tell you the story about Barney Rossett. One, I don't know if any of you who Barney Ross it, it, know who Barney Ross it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? No. Yeah. Well, he was a very good friend of mine. They were dropping like flies, unfortunately. And I had the, the great privilege of, of getting to know Barney and, and being very close to him. And you know, he had that Evergreen re Review, which is still coming out, this, this wonderful magazine. And one of the poems recently was, um, one day, I will find myself on the 6 o'clock news having stabbed you over some small thing that happened once too often, <laughs> and to which I may have overreacted. <laughs> so, so we have some lime juice here. And then we have, uh, I don't want any side pictures, honey, please. OK. I have this very strict rules about how I'd like to be photographed. Only front-wise, from high up, <laughs> no side views, especially after coming back from Peru and all those potatoes, my God. <laughs> but you still look gorgeous, Pamela. You probably didn't eat. I ate a lot, but I wasn't here for that long of a period. So oh, my God. I wish I had been. No, but you know what? If I had been in Lima, the food in Lima is to die. I would live in Lima. Oh, I know. It was incredible. I, I only had two meals. Well, I was, you know, I've always, I've been very vociferous about hating molecular food and fusion food. But I had the opportunity as a guest of Gaston Acurio, you know, who is this amazing, amazing guy. And he invited me to this 18 course, 18 dish wow. meal, wow. tracing the history of food in Peru. Wow. It was the first time that I understood how a dish can be completely deconstructed and then when you put it in your mouth, it all amalgamates and becomes a certain dish. But I've had that I've had that kind of food a lot of times. But he is a genius at it. And he did this big book with uh, Adrian Ferran, Ferran Adrian, which I had to carry back and it weighed 25 pounds. <laughs> but I, I understand that he's doing a restaurant with him now. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. OK, so we have the dressing here. We cook the shrimp in um, we cook the shrimp in, in, shrimp, in shrimp stock. Uh, we have cilantro leaves here that we're going to put right now. We don't have the jalapenos either. So uh, oh, here's here's jalapeno. Pretend you have it. I, I pretend I know. Pretend I'm happy when I'm blue. But I'm not blue. Actually, this year has been a very good year. I finally got inducted into the. James Beard, uh, who's who? So, so I'm going to roll, guys. I don't know what else I need. Maybe true love? I already had true love. 
but maybe I can have another true love. Yeah. It's not that easy to find. You can never have too many. You can never, okay. Okay, so here we are, chopping this thing very carefully because you know you don't want to ruin your nails. <laughs> so forget chopping your, your, your finger up. One time I was, um, I had just finished my book from Oaxaca and uh, I was making chocolate. I, was, I had decided that I was going to do this revolutionary way of doing chocolate where, where you don't have to you know, grind it with a metate forever because they put up a piece of coal under it so that the, so that the butter comes up. So, so there we are grinding. It didn't work. You know, I heated the food processor. I ground it up. I did all this kind of stuff. Nothing worked. So anyway, so Aaron was living at home at that time, and he gets, opens up the window and says, Mom, and, oh, and my manicurist was there in, looking at me in horror. And, my, and Aaron looks at Mom, are you making chocolate? And I said, yes. He says, yes, I am, honey. Boy, that's heavy. And I said, heavy is a word. I was working with this huge metate on top of my grill. Anyway, so you know about my son? who's become this big success. He used to be Aron Sanchez, son of Sarela Martinez. Now it's Sarela Martinez, mother of Aron Sanchez. And, uh, and so he, he never shares anything with me. He, he, he's afraid that I'm gonna be jealous or something. And I said, honey, why don't you let me enjoy your success and, and, and let me be part of it and, and everything. And I said, Every, I, everybody knows you're the star, but I'm the legend. <laughs> The avocado, we have the cilantro, and we have the shrimp, and you already ate it. Okay. Are we supposed to do another song? Yeah. That was good. Oh, it was good? Yeah. Delicious. It's delicious. Good. I'm happy you liked it. Okay. This is my favorite song. My mother used to play the piano. Any, anytime anybody did not pay attention to her, she would run to the piano. She would and we'd all run there and sing with her. I sang, before she died, every, all night I sang to her, all night. And this is my, one of my favorite songs that my mother said, um, why do you like it? I said, I don't know, I like it. I mean, what can I tell you? Can I have some more water? Or maybe I just have a margarita. Okay, the margaritas, let, let me just say courtesy of uh, 1921, tequila 1921, which is a wonderful tequila. They were extremely generous. And the margaritas are courtesy of them, and they also have some mezcal back there. Yeah. Okay. So this is called La Malpagadora, that one who pays badly, pays back badly. Me engaña injustamente, tú bien lo sabes.
helping me do is what I wanted to do. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to get to the point of your life where you can just do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. And I am so happy my kids are not here because it would have ruined it for me. You know, they would have been like dying. Like my beautiful daughter-in-law is here. She applauds everything I do, so it's great. Mostly everything. So we're waiting for our second, third grandchild there. Here. So anyway, so the next thing we're going to do, I guess I have to tell you more stories because since we're not set up. Okay, thank you, baby. Can we set up for the last thing? I, I, I just have to tell you, since we're not really cooking, I may as well just tell you stories, huh? Sing more, yeah. too. Sing. You, want, you, want, you want to sing one? Oh, you're singing so good. Okay, so we're going to sing a song that's almost like a, it's almost like a little poem. It's a sad song, but it's a beautiful song. It's called, Tu me acostumbraste. And it's a very romantic song. And it's, um, I'll tell you what it's about. It says, you got me used to all these things. Tu me acostumbraste. Okay, I'll tell you later, because it'll ruin it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no, no, I'll tell you, because, no, because it'll ruin the punchline. Tu, 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 como una tentación. Tú me acostumbraste, acostumbraste a todas esas cosas y tú me enseñaste que son maravillosas sutil llegaste a mí como una tentación llenando de inquietud mi corazón Yo no comprendía cómo se quería en tu mundo extraño. Yo por ti aprendí, por eso me pregunto al ver que me olvidaba. ¿Por qué no me enseñaste cómo se vive sin ti? Ok, let me explain what it sounds like. Okay. It's not my forte, but I have to sing it. It says, you got me used to all these things. Tú me acostumbraste a todas esas cosas. And you showed me how marvelous they are. And in your strange world, I learned to love. So now I ask myself, on seeing that you've left me, why didn't you teach? Oh, no, suddenly you came to me like a temptation, filling my heart with unrest. So now I ask myself, on seeing that you've left me, why didn't you teach me to live without you? So anyway, you know who that's for? Anyway, so. Yeah. Anyway, so here we are. Okay, so, uh, okay, jokes, stories. Stories, okay. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we, were, when we were at Cafe Marimba, and I was, uh, I was learning everything, talking about alone, he, was, he literally was working at the restaurant since he was about 10 years old. And he was working at the dessert station, he would come out and he'd say, okay, right here is a strawberry sundae, over here is a Mexican chocolate cake, over here is our vanilla ice cream. And he'd say, you know, he could tip the waiter. 
And at that time, Don Comerfeld was running the post. So I don't want to say hello to him at the table. And Don said to him, uh, how much did it pay you? He said, well, nothing because of the child labor laws. <laughs> he said, well, you know, I'm a lawyer. I can represent you. He said, no, thank you. I've already hired you, Kobe and Myers. <laughs> Hey, medicine, baby. Anyway, so here we have. Anyway, so I don't, I don't, I'm very proud of him. He's uh, in most ways, but I'm also proud of my son Rodrigo because he picked the best woman in the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> but not just because of that, because because they have a beautiful marriage and because he makes me proud. And he's he's a fabulous cook, and I'm trying to convince him to do a, a, a cookbook with me. I think that would be really good for the press. This is a, a time for me to, to actually thank the spill time. You don't want me to have any. Th this is the trick with Parkinson's. You have to take the pill right in time. And somebody has to open the box for you. Anyway, so um, I'm trying to think of more stories. See, I was supposed to be cooking most of the time. And what happened is that we're not cooking. So anyway. Stories are wonderful. Stories are wonderful. And I'm trying to. singing is fabulous. You like it? We only practice five songs, but it's okay. We can we can do another one. A ver qué vamos a hacer. Vamos a hacer unos somos. Okay, we're gonna sing another one. We haven't practiced this at all, but but it'll be okay. Ay unos ojos. Okay, we're just getting. I'm getting him the tone. Ay un okay. Ay unos ojos. Pero vas a cantar conmigo, ¿verdad? Que si me mira, hacen que mi alma tiemble de amor. Son unos ojos tan primorosos que ojos más lindos. tart and delicious. And the other one is chipotles, what? which are smoked jalapenos, yeah. which is what the flavor that is that you have in the it's chicken. It's a spice. It's a spice. What's spice? It's, it's a, a smoked jalapeno. Yeah. And they have been made since pre-Hispanic times. And I say that it's like bacon, that it tastes even good with shit. I mean, it's like one of those things that is fantastic. So I make, one of the things that I was going to teach you how to make, which you have the recipe for, and this is the best thing that, that you can ever make and have in your refrigerator. You take like one garlic clove, you have the recipe. No, maybe you don't have the recipe. Or maybe you do. In any case, it's, it's on my website. But you're going to take one garlic clove and one teaspoon of salt, and you're going to do it in the food processor. You're going to add one, um, one can of chipotas adobados, which are these, right here, and Mexican oregano. Mexican oregano is really not oregano. It's, it's a wild marjoram. And my mother, before she used it all the time, my mother used to rub it between her hands like that to release the aroma. And it grew wild in the ranch. And all our cows fed on it. So whenever we butchered, 
the, the meat was already flavored. So anyway, so, so, so what you do is that you puree the, 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 the uh, chipotle chilies, add olive oil, and the Mexican oregano, and that's it. And it keeps in the refrigerator for weeks. And you can put it on chicken and fish. Because the restaurant we used to make the, the salmon that we used to put the, the chipotle um, paste on it. And then we cooked it sort of halfway on the grill. And then we served it with a mayonnaise that we added the chipotle paste. So it's a, the most versatile thing ever. Please visit my website. You have no idea how many recipes I have in there, how many stories I have there. I mean, I really, really try to keep that like really, really up to date every single day. That's why we have all those hits. Any other, any other questions? Because we're almost uh, like out of time here. Let me tell you what's going to happen afterwards. This is going to be like a social hour. The Sarena Salon. Yeah, the, the, the place is open. You can use your tickets if you haven't used them. There's going to be an open bar. We're going to have music. I hope you, that you all will interact and stay for a little while and, and meet all my other fantastic friends because every single one of my friends is good at something and others are great at something. And all of them are wonderful people and wonderful friends. And I feel very, very fortunate in having all of you here tonight and, and, and part of my life. You know, like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, I always, uh, how, do you, how do you continue this? How do I continue this? I'm hoping to be able to get some companies to hire me, you know, maybe people with the Parkinson's drugs or people or companies just who really want a different kind of entertainment. You know, because, you know, you go to, I've gone to a lot of business meetings and everything, and the, the entertainment is so boring. And you know, if you, if, you, if you give me a subject, I can expound on it forever. So you know, you give me a message for your company, I'll be, I'll be there and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that it, uh, that it gets across, believe me. Is this on your website? What, this whole story? No, but it will no, be, because no, I just wanted to. About, about being able to contact you for things like this. Well, I just wanted to see how it went first. It went very well. <laughs> anyway, you know. My, my friend Pedro de Guinaga always said to me, how do you get people to give you the recipes? I said, well, I ask them to tell me their stories. And they tell me their stories, and they give me the recipes, and they always say to me, gracias por tomarme en cuenta. Thank you for taking me into account. Thank you for listening to my story, and more than anything, thank you for taking me into account and coming in and joining me this evening. <laughs> with a very sexy song. It's called A Media de la Noche. Yeah. We're gonna sing this a duet. Okay, before anything, let me tell you about Humberto. Humberto is part of a group of, of people. They're, they're classical violinists that are doing like modern, I mean, they're combining Veracruzan music with classical and with blues. And it sounds strange, but it is glorious. And he is the, the guitarist. They got their, their, the name of their newest CD is called Aliens of Extra, uh, Extraordinary Ability, because that's how they got their visa, because they're aliens of extraordinary ability. OK, so Humberto is our guitarist. And it's just a little plug for them, because they're wonderful. And I've had a ball working with, with uh, Humberto. A medias de la noche te soñaba, te soñaba abrazándote conmigo, te soñaba. Ya no duermas
here before we let go. The, uh, tequila 1921, Mezcales de Oaxaca, in the Mexican Cultural Institute, a Mexican tourism board, which only gave us a badge, but that's okay. And then, uh, and of course, Casa Mezcal, who are the best people ever. Thank you. Thank you so much.